If you believe you may have any information regarding this case, you are urged to contact the Santa Cruz County Coroner on 831-454-7790. This video features discussions of homicide, interpersonal violence, sexual abuse and drug abuse, among other topics some may find upsetting. Viewer discretion is advised. At about 2pm on the 27th of December 1998, a few sightseers were travelling through the San Lorenzo Valley in Santa Cruz County, California. On a turnout on Bear Creek Road, about 8 miles away from State Highway 9, they pulled over and something strange caught their eye. It soon became apparent that what they had spotted was a human body wrapped in blue tarp, lying on a steep hillside embankment in the remote mountainous area. Police were called to the scene, where they quickly noticed signs of foul play, and had to abseil down the mountainside to retrieve the body. It appeared as though the individual had died elsewhere and had been dumped. The decedent was, in time, determined to have been male. He was badly decomposed, with the post-mortem interval thought to be somewhere between three and eight weeks. At autopsy, the cause of death was revealed as multiple stab wounds to the throat combined with massive head injuries, confirming he had fallen victim to homicide. It appeared he'd been struck in the head at least twice, with a long narrow bar such as a fireplace poker. At his time of death, he was under the influence of drugs, specifically opiates, indicating he may have been a recreational user. The decedent, found to be of Caucasian descent, was around the age of 16 to 25, he stood at 5 feet 6 inches to 5 feet 8 inches tall and weighed approximately 150 to 160 pounds. His hair was medium to dark brown in colour. Though the hair at the front and sides of his head had been shaved down to 2 to 3 inches, he kept a 5 to 9 inch long ponytail at the back, into which he wove beads and other materials. His eyes were blue. He was found wearing a maroon or dark red long sleeve turtleneck shirt in size large, a 16 inch long white metal chain necklace with black spherical beads, blue or black oversized wide leg kickwear 91 jeans, a Tommy Hilfiger belt, and white socks. Shoes are not mentioned by any sources. The decedent had no form of identification on his person, nor was any found near his body. Authorities circulated his description in the local newspaper, though no one was able to put a name to him. A search of missing person reports also found no suitable matches. To this day, over 20 years later, he remains a John Doe. On the 13th of January 1999, a little over two weeks after John Doe's body was found, the Augusta police in Georgia received a call from a teenager identifying himself as Jeremy Coleman. The 17-year-old claimed he had been kidnapped, held captive, and sexually abused by a former California death row inmate namely 51-year-old Joseph Deb Tregeagle of Salt Lake City, Utah. Tregeagle had first been in trouble with the law in 1968, when he faced a minimum of three years and a maximum of 20 years in prison after pleading guilty to a sodomy charge. However, his sentence was suspended and he was instead ordered to spend 30 days in the Utah State Hospital followed by several months of probation. 
Tregeagle also faced a burglary charge at this time, which was continued without date. In July 1971, Tregeagle, then 23, was convicted of and sentenced to death for the first-degree murder of 17-year-old Ronald Allen Payton, who he sexually assaulted, struck in the head, and repeatedly stabbed to death earlier that year in January. Peyton's body remained unidentified until his driver's license was found in Tregeagle's possession upon his arrest. In 1972, Tregeagle's sentence was commuted from death to life when the US Supreme Court deemed the death penalty unconstitutional. In May 1977, it was reported that Tregeagle had escaped from imprisonment at the California Medical Facility though he was soon found and returned to his cell. In 1988, he was released on parole. A few years later, Tregeagle was arrested for unlawful possession of a firearm and subsequently sentenced to a further 18 months in prison. He appealed this sentence in February 1992, though his appeal was terminated on the merits without an oral hearing. When questioned about Coleman's allegations, Tregeagle admitted to picking up Coleman in Seattle in November 1998, and then to keeping him chained up in the back of his tractor-trailer truck for the following two months. When asked why he did this, Tregeagle claimed it was only because Coleman had confessed to being wanted for murder. Specifically, the murder of the unidentified man whose body was dumped in the San Lorenzo Valley. Following this discovery, Coleman, whose real name was found to be Jeremy Michael Towner, was charged with John Doe's murder. Authorities charged Tregeagle with kidnapping. Both Towner and Tregeagle were held in the Richmond County Jail, with the former's bond being set at one million dollars. By the time Towner was arrested in Georgia, the police in Santa Cruz had actually already found evidence against him and a number of other suspects with whom he associated. About a week earlier, officers had searched the suspect's residence and found a graphic illustration of a man with spiked hair, gripping two pistols and shooting a man with a ponytail in the head. Because the unidentified man had a ponytail, this was linked to him. Authorities initially entered the residence, expecting to find evidence linking the suspects to the murder of 58-year-old Gaylord Kelly Chilcote, a businessman who was found bound, gagged, bludgeoned and stabbed to death in his bedroom at about 9am on the 17th of November 1998 by deputies answering a request for a welfare check. The motive for the crime seemed to be robbery. Large amounts of cash and cheques, as well as liquor and jewellery, were missing from the residence. Chilcote's stab wounds were later noted as being very similar to those seen on John Doe. In connection to the murder of Kelly Chilcote, four suspects were arrested. 19-year-old Sean Patrick Petsnick, 21-year-old Gabriel Adam Baines, 25-year-old James Irwin Dotson, and 27-year-old Kimberly Lee Labor. Of these suspects, two were found to be connected to the murder of the unidentified man, namely Dotson and Labor, who were also in a relationship with one another. Dotson, Labor, Baines, and Petsnick were all members of a group of mostly homeless young people who called themselves the family. As the oldest in the group, Labor acted as their leader, describing herself as, quote, the mother with a mohawk who looked after the boys, unquote. Within the group, illicit drug use was ubiquitous, and drug money was usually obtained by theft. Petsnick had lived across the street from Kelly Chilcote in Watsonville, and had done odd jobs for him in the past. 
When he was 17, Petznik's parents kicked him out of the house due to his drug problem and the fact he'd stolen from them multiple times. About a year later, in 1997, Petznik started planning to rob Chilcoat. On the 13th of November 1998, Petznik, Dotson and Labor drove to Watsonville to have a look at Chilcoat's house. Reportedly, Chilcoat saw them outside. They waved to him. Upon their return to Santa Cruz, the three met with another member of the family, who spent 10 to 15 minutes trying to talk the others out of their plan, as everyone in downtown Santa Cruz knew they had gone to Watsonville that day and had figured out what they were planning. Petznik's girlfriend also advised him not to go through with things. Regardless, four days later, on the 17th, Chilcote's body was found in his ransacked bedroom, along with the murder weapon, a butcher knife. The family's name soon appeared on law enforcement's radar, and Baines was arrested on the 19th in Santa Cruz. Dodson, Labor, and Petznik were arrested on the 30th during a non-fatal shootout in Florida. While in custody, Dotson, Labor, and Jeremy Towner, who I mentioned earlier, also gave details of how John Doe was killed. His murder took place approximately one week before Chilcote's. On the 10th of November 1998, a friend of Petsnick named Micah Russell, along with Towner, a young homeless man from Florida named Eric, aka Hook, and Eric's girlfriend, Anna, drove up to an abandoned cabin at 800 Creek Drive in Boulder Creek, where Labor lived, in order to retrieve some of Russell's things which he'd left there. When they arrived, Dotson and Labor were inside the cabin. While Russell and Anna went to sleep, the other four stayed up. When Russell awoke in the morning, he found Eric was gone. By this point in the story, it's unclear where Anna was, as she's never mentioned again in the court documents. The only other known fact about Anna is that she owned a Toyota Auto with white license plates. Later that day, while out in town, Towner revealed to Russell how he, Dotson and Labor had killed Eric during the night. The full account of Eric's murder, compiled from various sources, is as follows. Most state that the motive was, once again, robbery. Eric had a 38 calibre handgun, which he'd been offering to sell or exchange for heroin, though the trio did not want to pay. Labor alleged that Eric had committed sexual assault and, quote, touched her while she slept. Although Dotson backed this claim up, Towner did not. The prosecutor in Labor's case did make a note of how her version of events didn't fully match up with the evidence, so take that as you will. Labor continued that after finding out about the supposed molestation, her boyfriend Dotson flew into a rage. Dotson began the attack by bludgeoning Eric, who was already under the influence of opiates, with a baseball bat until blood poured from his head as he convulsed. Labor described how she wanted to tell Dotson to stop, though she claimed she couldn't get the words out. When finished, Dotson handed Labor the bat. According to Labor's statements, she struck Eric in the head with the bat once, and then simply slit his throat to, quote, stop him from moving. Towner, however, described in graphic detail how Labor repeatedly stabbed Eric in the throat with an exacto knife, which she twisted in the wounds. Towner himself admitted to hitting Eric in the head with a telescope and to cutting Eric's throat with the same knife, albeit only at Dotson's request. News reports also described Labor crushing Eric's skull with a brick until it shattered. 
When Eric was dead, the trio took his gun and his wallet and then dumped his body in the mountains near the cabin. They dumped most of his wallet's contents, including his ID, into a bin at the Santa Cruz Metro Center. Towner recalled how later on, Dotson and Labor joked about Eric's death, mocking his gurgling sounds and pleas for help. They reportedly made similar jokes after killing Chilcoat a week later. While recounting the story of Eric's murder to Russell, Towner reportedly sounded proud, and it didn't seem as though he'd been forced to participate. When Dotson and Labor found out about what Town had said, they threatened and physically assaulted him, and ordered Russell to quote, keep his mouth shut. Later that day, Russell met with Petsnik, who already knew about Eric's killing by then. On the 14th, three to four days after the murder, Towner and Russell left Santa Cruz on the bus. That same day, Dotson was seen with a gun, presumably Eric's. It is unclear if this was the same gun used in the Florida shootout on the 30th of November. In April 2001, the first to be convicted for their role in the murders was Labor, who was charged with conspiracy, burglary, robbery, personal use of a firearm during a felony, and two counts of murder. She pled guilty or no contest to all counts in order to avoid the death penalty, and received the maximum sentence of 62 years to life. In August 2018, former California Governor Jerry Brown reduced Labor's sentence to a minimum of 20 years imprisonment after hearing about her, quote, path to productive sobriety, unquote. On 7th of February 2019, after hearing at the Central California Women's Facility in Chowchilla, Labor was denied parole. Dotson similarly pled guilty to the same charges to avoid the death penalty. He reportedly showed no remorse for murdering Chilcote, who he deemed a, quote, paedophile homosexual. Dotson maintained his claim that the plan was never to kill Chilcote, but to rob him, but regardless is currently serving life without parole at High Desert State Prison in Susanville, California. Petsnik was charged with conspiracy, first-degree murder, burglary, and robbery in concert. He was found guilty and sentenced in July 2001 to life without parole at Mule Creek State Prison in Ione, California. After being charged with robbery and second-degree murder, Towner pled no contest. Although he was only 16 at the time of John Doe's murder, a decision was made to try Towner as an adult. In September 2001, he was found guilty and sentenced to 22 years to life in prison. He will be eligible for parole in 2023. Baines was the last to be convicted. He maintained his claim that though he partook in the robbery of Chilcote, he did not know a murder was going to take place. He is currently serving 25 years to life and will be eligible for parole in 2026. And as for Tregeagle, the man who abducted Towner, he was found guilty in July 1999 and convicted of false imprisonment, possession of a firearm during an attempt to commit a dangerous felony, and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. He served 12 and a half years in the Augusta Transitional Center in Georgia and was released in January 2012. So we know the story behind John Doe's death. We know who killed him and we know why. Yet we know nothing about who he was other than the following details. He went by the nickname Hook, though it's believed his real name was Eric. He was from Florida. He had a girlfriend named Anna who owned a Toyota Auto with white license plates. 
He was a heroin user and had been homeless at the time of his death in November 1998. He had brown hair, cut into a mullet-like style, and blue eyes. He was about 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 8 and 150 to 160 pounds. And he was most likely between 16 and 20 at the time of his death, though he may have been as old as 25. Over the years, multiple missing people have been ruled out as being this decedent. Please check the description for a list of these rollouts. Again, if you believe you may have any information regarding this case, you are urged to contact the Santa Cruz County Coroner on 831-454-7790. Thank you very much for giving Eric a moment of your day.